Praise the Lord, everyone. I want to give you greetings in the mighty name of Jesus and thank God for this great privilege to be with you another time. Certainly, we appreciate your um, support. I mean, we definitely do. It's important to us that you are there praying for us and helping us to spread this gospel. And as we look to you so often, asking you to use this as a medium to witness. Tell others about this. It is not something that may be so profoundly uh, rendered, but the point is that something will be said to generate an interest, to spark some sense of knowledge, to know what about more about Jesus Christ, and we thank God for that. So we want you to understand that you are partners Amen with us in this ministry, and we are certainly grateful and thankful to God for this. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your blessing and your mercy and your righteousness and your power. We honor you, God, because you are so great, you are so loving, and you care for us so much that there's this deep sense of relationship, this great love that you have for us. Amen. Sometimes the writer, even David, wants to know what is man that thou art mindful of him. And so often we think about ourselves, our undone condition, and so often that we have denied, Lord God, really continuing in with you and serving you the way we ought to. And yet you love us, Lord Jesus Christ, and restore us, my God. You make such provision for us to come boldly to the throne of grace. Amen. What love, what care, what compassion, great God, you have for mankind. We pray, God, that you will strengthen us that we grow to understand more and more about you and not just understand, but to want to know more about you. Amen. To find ourselves truly enthralled about your word and the companionship, the relationship, Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for your mercy and your grace and your love. Have your way in the name of Jesus. Bless what we say tonight. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 So again, we thank God for all of you as you dedicate yourselves to knowing the word of God, to grow in, in him and to support this ministry. What we have been doing is just looking in St. John, the gospel, several chapters, chapter one chapter after the next, and just picking out certain things as we go through. Uh, and we are now in chapter seven. And... I am sort of combining chapter seven with some important, well, an important word that is used in chapter five, where Jesus says he wants to make the man whole. And Jesus reiterates this point in chapter seven about wholeness. It seems that he was so driven to do that and the opponents. And when you say the Jews, we're talking about the religious opposition, which would include the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the scribes, even the Sanhedrin in general. And they were so hell-bent on killing him. <laughs> you wonder why. But this is all God's plan. That's all I can say. Because if you really look at it, here is an individual they, whom they didn't really recognize at all. Well, I wouldn't say at all. You know, there may be some secret understanding of who he is, but I su suspect the popularity of Jesus, the fact that he could do so many things, and he spoke with such authority, amen, indicating that he is indeed the Son of God, that he is the Messiah. Because you can imagine people who were waiting years, centuries, so to speak, for this Messiah. He comes and they don't recognize him. And to use the word recognize is kind of simplifying the fact. Because I often think about the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. They were all expecting him, but when he came, the authorities didn't even know that. Herod, the king, when he heard the report from the wise men, the pilgrims, they wondered, where, I mean, well, the question there is, where is he that is born king of the Jews? So we have seen a star in the east and have come to worship him. 
And he asked the scribes, is this true? They were in and they said, ah, true, true, true. But when you really look at it, and I said this so often, here it is, he comes, they were expecting him, preparing for him, and they missed him. Not only did they miss him, but in a sense, when he shows up to authenticate his ministry, they want to do away with him. And I'm certainly hopeful that all of us, the whole religious world, Christianity, all the people who claim that they're godly and they're waiting for the coming of the Lord, that we are not so careless in what we do or how we anticipate or prepare for the second coming because it's not going to be like the first in the twinkling of an eye ready or not here i come this is not hide and seek ladies and gentlemen this is reality and there's in the twinkling of an eye means that there is no time for us to go to make amends not even time to say save me jesus not even to say jesus because it is so fast so we have to be ready prepared waiting and I mean ready, so that the entire focus, and when I say entire focus, obviously we eat, drink, sleep, work, do things that, but the, 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 the thrust, the consciousness that drives us is that we want to stay holy and live a life that when he comes, we will be ready to meet him. Because this is no, there will be no time to evaluate who he is or whether or not this is he. It will be too late if we don't make it. Praise God. Um, yes, others may be saying there may be another chance. Mm, I'm not saying there is or there is not. One thing I know, I am not waiting for that. This is the chance of a lifetime. And I thank God that through his love and mercy, amen, he accepted me. And I believe this is Christ. This is the way. This is truth. Now, we go back to the whole idea of the Jews. And when I said Jews, as I said earlier on, we're talking about the religious opponents, all right? So here in this chapter seven, we find that there is a feast going on, feast up there in Jerusalem. And this is what we call Feast of uh, Booths. It is usually celebrated in September or October and uh, it's said to be something, it has to do with leafy shelters. People were in shelters because they were more or less um, commemorating the faithfulness to Israel that God provided them during their wilderness experience. And uh, here it was a time of thanksgiving. And it said that um, there were basically eight feasts or festivals in Israel and three of them were sort of mandatory for males 20 and up. And this is one of them. So we see, therefore, his brothers, Jesus' brothers are going to the feast. And they are, in a sense, taunting him. And I'm not sure that is a good word, but they're asking him, aren't you going to the feast? Um, because you need to go there to show your prowess, show who you are, that kind of stuff. And he says, well, I'm not ready yet. I'm not really going. And in interestingly enough to say that they didn't really believe that he is who <laughs> he really was. Um, and these are his brothers. I'm sure they understood. They saw that he was a different character than the rest of them. Um, you remember the scripture when Mary and Joseph went up to Jerusalem and they had to go back to find him because they thought they had him in the crowd. And he said, wist you not that I must be about my father's business. And they pondered these sayings in their heart. In fact, um, even earlier on, and I'm even probably even earlier on, or when Jesus was brought to the temple to be blessed and Simeon said, um, what he said about him, oh, this child is sent to the rise and the falling of men in Israel. She, Mary, his mother, thought about what um, Simeon was saying. So 
she knew the mother, but the brothers apparently, they, they weren't so preoccupied with their brother. You know how brothers are in general. And the idea here was that, not idea, the fact is that they were ready to kill him. The Jews, as we said, his opponents were trying to get at him. They had the hatred um, and they hated him because of who he really was. Um, there's a sense in which the religious life that they lived was so surface. In fact, when Jesus confronted them, he mentioned so many things to show their uh, illegitimate role in a sense that you said you know about Moses, but you don't believe him, you don't practice uh, things. In fact, at, at one point, was saying that here you are trying to kill me and don't have the evidence. Even Nicodemus at one point was saying, you know, the law says you don't do that. And the others were so incensed with him and said, oh, you're from Galilee too. So there was this tension. And no matter what happens, even though the scripture seems to be um, pre preparing us with a sort, sort of tension that he's going to be killed, it was not like that. It was not going to happen until he was ready. That's the point. That's the beautiful thing here. No man could take his life. His purpose was Calvary. Every step of the way was Calvary. And what we look at and what we see in this trek to Calvary, what we see in this pursuit of man's redemption, amen, is the enemy trying at so many points to throw him off. Remember now, he is fully man and fully God. And the devil, he is hell-bent too on destroying this plan. Remember, he did something like that in the Garden of Eden. So here he thought, Aha, uh -huh, here's another man. Let's see what we can do with him. But as someone said, God tricked him. This was no ordinary man. He couldn't deal with this character here. Amen. So here we see him coming out of the wilderness, devil tempting him. And we see him using these religious zealots to thwart the plan of salvation, which was not going to happen. But it shows the power, the authenticity of Jesus. And... Um, so as verse five says, neither did his brethren believe in him. As I said earlier on, his brothers didn't. And he comes in, well, it is said that, not just it is said, we notice that when there is these festivals, many, 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 many people are in Jerusalem, many throngs of individuals in Jerusalem. Notice on the day of Pentecost, notice here too, pilgrimage would go there. I mean, this this is important. Um, and, you know, I remember my pastor used to say that <laughs> you never know when the Lord is coming, maybe coming on a day when <laughs> there's some kind of festivities. But then when you think about how time frame works, it's not like it's the same time in U.S. or in Jamaica as it is in Jerusalem or such place. But the point is he's coming back. I don't care what's going on. He's coming back. So the point here is that many people were coming and they sent out individuals to waylay Jesus to get him. And these were the temple police. These were supposed to be Levites and um, they really didn't have too much power outside of the temple area. But in any case, they, they try to exercise some authority. And interestingly enough, you can see the power of the message of individuals who just wanted to hear something, who just wanted to know something about Jesus. That when they came back, and I'm jumping here, um, when the officers came back without Jesus, in verse uh, 34 to 4, and some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees and said unto them, Why have ye not brought him? I mean, this is serious stuff, man. I was just saying, they were probably upset. Look, we send you out there for Jesus. What are you coming back for? Where is he? 
But here it is. The message was so powerful. I mean, they, they, they accepted it for what it is. The officers answered, never man speak like this. I can imagine they had um, a, 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 a job to do. They had a responsibility to get him. But I mean, they sat there listening to him. They were so enthralled with the message of life and hope. Glory to God that they completely forgot what they came for. Actually, it's not that they completely forgot. Jesus was not ready yet. But you can see it woven into the whole fabric of the fact that Jesus had to give his message there. Amen. So about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up. You know, he was worried. He went right into the temple. And you can imagine his opponents were all stricken by his appearance, knowing that they are seeking to kill him, but can't touch him. <laughs> what are you? You know, can't touch him. And um, they went up in the midst of the temple and he taught. The Jews marveled, saying, how knoweth this man let us having never learned? See what's going on here? Again, no matter what he did, no matter how profound the healing was, no matter what it was, even if he raised that dead and is he you know talking about that it's so ironic that when they realized that he had raised Lazarus from the dead I mean they wanted to kill Lazarus again I mean I don't know it's 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 just real stupidity but who am I to know what's going on anyway here therefore they marveled and saying well we don't know him um and why when they say we don't know him number one he was not the birth that they were anticipating. Number two, he didn't study under some rabbi. You know, he wasn't from their school. He was an old boy of the school to which they went. Um, the family was not part of that Sanhedrin council, not the high, um, the Sadducees, you know. So he was just some itinerant guy. How do you know all that? Who is he? And remember now, when he spoke, he spoke with such authority. I and the Father are one. He that sent me is with me. I can forgive sin. Now, you know something? He was stepping on some serious territory that even studying the word, they were saying, he is blasphemous. And he says, Jesus answered, said, my doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Amen. And you know, this didn't rub them. This didn't rub them the right way. Because here he is really validated his claim. And it comes up and he says, um, did not Moses give you the law and yet none of you keep the law? What? You can imagine. He is confronting them. And if you see some videos of how Jesus, the, 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 the attire is so radical and different, and he is going up in their face, these authorities, and denouncing their uh, whole religious and theological um, ideas. Did not Moses give you the law and yet none of you keep it? What? That is ridiculous, you could think. Why go ye about to kill me, in a sense? What evidence do you have? You can't kill me without trying me and all that stuff. So he knew, they knew, even though some of the people were saying, you know, he's crazy, nobody's trying to kill him. But it is said that the people in Jerusalem knew that. The crowd, the pilgrims probably didn't know that. Amen. So the Pharisees knew that. The temple police knew that. Amen. And those people over there, they, they, they knew exactly what was going on. But he was not afraid. There was no way. And here again, can you imagine the human part of it would succumb to the knowledge that he is, I'm going to be killed and decide that he's not going up to the feast. But then he couldn't do that because he'd be disobeying a, a fundamental law. He had to go to the feast. Yes. Amen. And there is a crowd that he must witness to. Amen. Glory to God. They said he had a devil. He says, Moses gave. And here it is. And I wanted to look at this. 
They're looking at the law. They're looking at the Sabbath. They're looking at what he's doing versus what they're doing. Here's what he says. Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are ye angry at me because I have made a man every withhold on the Sabbath day? So Jesus is concerned about the whole man. He is concerned about rescuing us from hell. Yeah, the circumcision is important. But notice what would happen, no matter what he does. And it's important to understand that if he's doing it and it's a Sabbath day, that's a significant turning point. There is going to be more than just some ordinary, ah, how important. They weren't concerned about anyone getting healed. They weren't concerned about anyone um, seeing or raised, raised from the dead. You don't do those things on the Sabbath. And yet Jesus is saying, it's supposed to be uh, circumcised on the, seventh, the eighth day and it falls on the Sabbath day. You'll do it. And yet this is just some, uh, one part is not making the man whole. Jesus is saying, what are you worried about? I I want to make you every whit whole completely well. You are sick people. And I want to make you whole. I want to bring you into a relationship with God. But you are so stubborn. What is wrong? You don't understand God's will and his purpose concerning you. Glory to God. Judgment according to the parents, but judge righteous judgment. And then we realize there's something wrong. But the point I'm making here, I really want to emphasize is he wants to give us complete deliverance. That's his purpose of coming, to regenerate us, to redeem us. Amen. And here they are stuck in a religious hole, a religious bind, so enwrapped in it that they can't get out of the cocoon because of their lack of interest in the Messiah. Lack of interest in a wide way, lack of interest in a sense that they didn't recognize him. Jesus came for that purpose. Remember um, when he came out of the wilderness in St. Luke chapter 4, went into the temple. There is something about what he says and how he does it. He's authenticating his authority. He went into the temple and they gave him the book. Verse 18, verse 17, and there was delivered, verse 16, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when it opened the book, he found the place where it was written. No coincidence. Listen. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captive, and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are bruised, bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. This is not just some ordinary recitation. When he read it, it exuded authority. It verified that he is the one it was speaking about. They wanted the gracious word, but no matter how profound it was, they were going back to, isn't this Joseph's son? Is this Mary's son? And you know something? No matter who you are in this world, we fall into one of these categories. He had to preach the gospel to the poor. Somewhere in there we fall. To heal the brokenhearted. 
And all these are situations where we need to come out of to be whole. And it's not just physical wholeness, but spiritual wholeness. Glory to God. To preach deliverance to the captives, how many of us, and even those persons who are listening, who are trying to kill him, they were captive by the enemy. They couldn't see who he was. Their eyes were blind. God is calling us to see him as he is today. Hear the call of Jesus Christ. Life-giving call. He wants to make us whole. So many of us are sitting by the pool waiting with the troubling of the water. But he comes with a word. Will thou be made whole? Are you willing for that wholeness? Yes, which part do you fall in? Recovering of sight to the blind. Some, some, some defect somewhere. Some defect somewhere. Amen. I mean, when, when you think about it, I'm thinking about, I mean, so much wrong with our bodies today. You know, I go to my primary care and he's telling me so many things. And he just raised the question, do you believe in prayer? He figures, well, brother man, I'm trying, but I don't want to load you up with medicine. And there's much I can do, but prayer can really change. And I'm so appreciative of this. Yes, yes, I'm appreciative of that. Because it is not just that you're blind, but you're lacking something. And I want to give you not just your sight, but to make you whole. Set a limit on that bruise. So many of us are crushed by the enemy. We're bruised by our situation. Amen. We are just in a desperate urge to get out of this death trap. And no matter what we do, something is holding us back, bruised by our past, bruised by our lack of knowledge. My God, he wants to make us whole. Look at what he says. He says, you're all so caught up in what I'm doing. Great God from heaven. And I want to make let me back. Here it is. We go back to it. You are just so upset because I made a man ever with whole. Yeah, that is in St. John chapter 5. From 1 to 9. Amen. Look at it. So many times the word whole is used. After this, there was a feast, the feast of the Jews, and Jesus came up to Jerusalem. Remember? Feast, feast, feast. And then he saw a place where a great multitude of impotent folk, a blind halt withered. And there was a time when an angel would go in the water and trouble the water. And whoever steps in first would be healed. But Jesus is passing by. Glory to God. He's passing by blind Bartimaeus. He's passing by blind Morris. He's passing by wounded Morris. Jesus. And you hear the thought. You call on Jesus. Jesus said, well, you were made whole. And I understand this man. He had to make his case for Jesus said, take up your bed and walk. Because he wanted him to be whole. And immediately the man was what? Made whole. And you, my Jewish friend, because I made this man whole, completely well, completely put together. None of you could do that. You couldn't do it on the Sabbath day or in the other day. Why are you so preoccupied with the Sabbath? Sabbath means for man and not man for the Sabbath. I mean, look. You're so stuck upon a day when you do other things. And he constantly was trying to give them hints as to the lack of knowledge and the real reason. Yeah, but Jesus, he said, um, how be you not? We know this man whence he is, but Christ cometh, no man knoweth whence he, can, he comes. Jesus is calling us today to understand who he is and to see him for his power and his majesty. He wants to save us. He wants to make us whole. He wants to give us a new lease on life. Because when you look at how some people live, that's not the reality that should be evident in their existence. 
you know, our reality is maybe different and not because we are better than they, maybe just because God has saved us or maybe just because, I don't know, luck would have it. I'm not sure what it is, but I still believe that anyone who is saved and finds Jesus or, not, or Jesus finds him and changes his life, he is exponentially better off through salvation than he was without it. And not only that, he is obviously prepared for a better life. One that is prepared for him. Jesus Christ will give us those of us who are whole. So we want to understand that no matter what is happening, because Jesus had a plan, a plan of salvation for all of us, we can see him, amen, sal um, making an effort, well, not making an effort, urging us on to believe in him. Amen. And we go later on, next time we we'll go to this where he stands in the feast and cries out if any man thirst. What is happening here is that the whole thing becomes just a ritual. We don't want to do that. And it's the same way I fear that you know, sometimes our services are just, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't even be saying that, just theatrical performances. We can sing, we can preach, we can move crowd, have people hanging out the chandeliers, as they would say. But when people leave, are they made whole? When people come in burdened, do they leave whole? Oh God, Jesus have mercy. What is it that drives us to make that trek to that building on Sundays, on Wednesdays or Thursdays? And some assemblies will have something every single night. But let us examine ourselves my friend, whether or not we go there to criticize the leader of the youth group because he or she is not doing it right or the pastor because he's not doing it right or the deacon or the board of trustees or nothing is running in order, but we're so preoccupied with those things that we miss the message of holiness, a clean heart, a righteous life. Amen. We just like, I hate to say, maybe those Jews. We don't want to kill anybody physically, but we just want to just diminish the individuals. And that's why people have to be so strong. You have to, let me tell you something. When you are saved and you know that God is leading you, you're not trying to be, um, what do you call, haughty or um, arrogant. You're just going to have to believe that you are living God's way and don't worry about what somebody says. You know, those of us who try to just pine and whine because somebody says something about you, you are just wasting time. You know, that's not going to stop. You're going to have to focus on Jesus. He is my doctor and my lawyer, and I won't take it back. You don't have to be showing off on that. You just know it. And sometimes you have to let people know that you don't care what they say. You are going to live a life of holiness because some people are just on that. We need wholeness. And when we are whole, we don't find it to be so critical of others. We're not just tearing others down. We want to build. Yeah, because you know something? He has given us gifts to build one another. But sometimes we leave those gifts locked up in a lockbox. Say, I don't want to go. I'm not doing this, that. No, no, no. That's crazy stuff, man. <laughs> you know, that is way out crazy stuff. And nobody's going to stop me talking about that. Because the scripture says, the gifts are for so and so. What are you doing with your gift? What am I doing with my gift? What is X doing with his gift? What is Y doing with her gift? Praise 
God. Here we have individuals who study the law and when the Messiah comes, they miss him. Don't miss the second coming. It won't be pretty. You see all these movies they have, people just going up in the sky. I don't know, it may very well be like that. It's the dramatic uh, presentation. <laughs> you boy, we hurrying to go to church. <laughs> church, not no church today or anytime, anytime, forever. Glory to God. That's why, that's why it's important to understand that we are the church individually, a part of it. So when he's gathering us, it doesn't matter where you are, you're just caught up, electrified, bless the Lord Jesus Christ, magnetic force, leave those detractors alone. When Jesus is ready to lay down his life, that's good time. He's going to have to get that message out. Praise God. So we thank God for tonight. And just think about it. No matter what is going on, the festivities and the ups and downs and all that, seek wholeness from God. Trust him. Believe in him. Father, we thank you for your blessing and your mercy. We honor you tonight for your grace and your truth that you are still in the blessing business. You're still in the deliverance business. You're still, amen, giving us life and hope and joy and peace. I worship you tonight, Lord, and I thank you, God. Oh, Jesus, that you're so loving, so kind. Help us all to understand that we need to support one another in this ministry, that we're building the kingdom of God. There is nothing. We don't own it. Amen. There is no share in it. Amen. We're not getting any dividend from it. Lord Jesus Christ, that is so personally ours. We are just blessed by being fully engaged. And we thank you and have your way in our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. seriously grateful for all of you who tune in and subscribe and desire to use this as a means to witness to others so we become all missionaries to the lord to spread the word praise god